Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. This morning we're going to be in chapters 11 and 12 in Isaiah. Let's open a word of, a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word that teaches straight, that teaches us what you have us to do. When we look at the Israelites and how God was dealing with them, help us to know that you always deal justly with those that are your children as well as those that are your enemies. And as we look towards the future, we realize you'll always keep all of your promises to us. Do as we study, help us to understand how we might use it in our lives today. Boys, in Christ's name. Amen. I will give a shout out this morning to some of our northern uh, viewers, uh, Paul and Carol. Uh, Paul is enjoying a new knee. Uh, so I guess he can genuflect better now. So, Paul, say hi to you and to uh, Carol. Also, Bernie and Ruth, Dewey and Penny, and Gary and Chris. Haven't seen you guys in a while. Uh, we're looking forward to all of you coming down again this winter. Uh, so, we're in Isaiah chapter 11. And it's a drastic change from chapter 10. Okay, can everybody get there? Mm -hmm. uh, while you're there, I'm going to ask uh, Ken if he'd share uh, a verse with us this morning. Yes, uh, I, I, this morning here, I was in my, well, my quiet time and it come to my attention through something I read that it said that in the Samuel, Samuel said that look at the, look at the heart, forget what it looks like outside. In other words, our God doesn't look for, for what we look like. It's what our heart shows us. Very good. Amen. 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 That's what he said about David. David is a man after his own heart. So chapter 11 and chapter 12 talk about a new time. It starts out in verse 1 of chapter 11. There took come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. After Jesse is here this morning. <laughs> and a branch of grow out of the roots. It's talking about a time in the future. We'll talk about what that future is, but I want you to understand the last couple of chapters, God was really being hot, dealing harshly with Israel and with Judah. Uh, in chapter 10, verses 15 through 19, verses 33 through 34, God was dealing very harshly with them. He told them that he was going to judge them for their sin of rebellion, for their turning away from him. And one of the things that the Israelites and we have in common is that we often turn away from God. We don't necessarily think we turn as bad as they did, but it's a slow process. We start by missing a few things, uh, prayer maybe, or Bible study. And then suddenly you realize that you haven't prayed in a while. And sometimes you haven't read your Bible in a while. You've avoided church and so on. It's a slow process. The book of Hebrews talks about five different times that people begin to stray away from God. And it starts out very simply as like a boat that slips its moorings, it kind of drifts away in the current. So it's not always a radical jump and say, well, I no longer believe in God. I'm going to follow this uh, false religion for a while. It's more of just a drifting away. So when God finally has enough, he judges the people, whether they be believers or non-believers. And when he judged Israel, he told them, I'm going to bring this to you to judge you. And it was Assyria at first, and then later on it was Babylon that came through. And then, of course, there's Alexander Greatman on down through history. God has always judged his people harshly because they were supposed to be a light unto the world of what it was like to be able to follow a one true God. And they rebelled continually, as we all do today. But what he, verse 24 of chapter 10, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, don't be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod, lift up his staff against you in the name of, in the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and his indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him, like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, as his rod was on the sea, so he will lift it up in the man, manner of Egypt. God has delivered him before, and he kept telling him, says, I will deliver you. In fact, Isaiah's second son was named, there will always be a remnant returning to God. So against that backdrop, a pretty harsh punishment to Assyria after he had, uh, Assyria had accomplished God's purpose, and then Babylon and God had done that over and over and over again. In chapter 11 and 12, he makes a break. And I want to talk a little bit about, well, probably a lot about 
chapter 11 and chapter 12. The first verse is, um, if I can break it down for you a little bit, it, it talks about there's a rod that comes from the stem of Jesse. Uh, some translations have David there, and uh, there's a reason why he started with Jesse. Jesse, of course, is the father of David, and so he talks about the root, and the root is Jesse. Jesse was the root, and he was also a lowly family, uh, considering David's glorious power as king, and of course his son also as king. But it came from a family, a regular family. They weren't not, weren't a rich family. They were a family that served in Saul's army. The brothers did, and then David was out watching the sheep and so on. It wasn't a rich or a well-known family, but God said in his word here, he said, it came forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. So God is showing here that he was there at the beginning of David, and he will be there at the end of David because he will place his son on David's throne. So it's a promise of God that the Davidic line, although not always spiritual, not always righteous, that the Davidic line will be succeeded on down in time when Christ sits on the throne during the millennium. Can everybody follow that? But that's why some of your translations will say, uh, from the stem of David, because David was more glorious. But in some ways, uh, Isaiah or God chose to put it down as the family, Jesse's family, Jesse's son. And David was the least of all, or at least the youngest of Jesse's son. And then the branch shall grow up out of its, out of its uh, roots. I want you to hold your place here and turn it over to um, chapter 4, verse 2 of Isaiah. Chapter 4, 4 verse 2. We talked about this when we were in chapter 4, but chapter 4, uh, verse 2 says, In that day, and again, when you see in that day, it's almost always talking about the coming millennium, tribulation and or the millennium to follow. Not always, but you can tell by the contents of the verses and the, and the context of what's going on there. It says, In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. So that branch is a person. That person is Jesus. So when you see that and move on back to chapter 11, that first verse there is literally speaking about how God was engineering his son Jesus to take over the throne of David all as far back as Jesse. And then he, all of Jesse's sons uh, were passed by Samuel. And then Samuel said, that's the one God wants me to anoint. Of course, David spent a lot of time before he became a king. But he became a king when he was 30 years old, ruled for 40 years, and died when he was 70. And so the branch that's talking about, verse 1, grew out of Jesse's root. And God is always at the beginning. In the beginning, God created out of the earth, Genesis chapter 1. And so everything stemmed from Adam and Eve. That's why in the gospel accounts of Jesus and Matthew, it goes all the way back to Abraham, and in Luke, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. So we're all children of Adam and Eve, all the way back. Ancestry.com did not do that. So it's about to go to the Now, uh, turn back to Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter 11. Hold that and go over to Matthew. Chapter 2. I always want to share uh, other verses that correspond with the Old Testament to show there's a direct connection. The Old Testament is the foundation for the New Testament. So, Matthew chapter 2, over there, verse 23. last verse of the, the chapter. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. He's not a Nazarite. He did not take a Nazarite vow. Samson was a uh, Nazarite. But he was a Nazarene became, because he came from Nazareth. Now, he wasn't born in Nazareth. Where was he born? That's what heard. Okay, so why did he end up in Nazareth? Okay. So he spent a couple of years in weather place between Bethlehem and Nazareth, where else did he live? Egypt. Egypt, but how long? Two years. About two years? Yeah. About two years. Right. 
So we know that there was only one son when they came back to Nazareth, and the rest of the family was born. But he was, he was the son of God, but he was also the son of Mary, and she had other sons. All right, so 223, uh, Matthew says that he was living in Nazareth a great part of his life from probably age two or so until he was 30. So the bulk of his life was spent in Nazareth. All right, now back to chapter 11 of Isaiah. It goes on to say, in verse two, that the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is complete subjection to the spirit. The Holy Spirit rested on the Old Testament saints. And what does the Holy Spirit do for the believers in the New Testament? He dwells. He dwells us. He's going to live within us. So in the Old Testament, God says he's living in the midst of them. It, it is where he would empower different people. David, in Psalm 51, cried out because of his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba. He cried, please don't take the Holy Spirit from me. But there's no indication that God ever did much more to show that the Holy Spirit was always with David in power. So some of the judges, like with Gideon and Samson, some of the other judges, the Holy Spirit left them. You know, they come on occasionally to empower them to deliver Israel from the enemy. <clears throat> and so when you have this Spirit of the Lord, verse 2, shall rest upon them, this is the complete indwelling of, of Jesus as the Holy Spirit. You know, I can't explain the Trinity. I think the Holy Spirit is fully God, Jesus is fully God, and the Father is fully God. But somehow this Holy Spirit resting on Jesus is to give him the, the power and strength to rule and reign um, for the whole millennium or for the whole all of eternity. I don't know how that works out, whether he needs the Holy Spirit to do all that stuff because he is God. Uh, but the way this, this is written in the original Hebrew is that the Holy Spirit empowers Jesus not that he's not there now, but that he's empowered by the Holy Spirit to rule and reign for at least a thousand years. And then the, the fruit of the Spirit there is, is the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. And there's three sets of twos. And so the Spirit of wisdom and understanding simply means that he had great wisdom. Not that he didn't, not that he lacked in anything. I think a lot of this is more for our benefit that we can have spirit leading, we can have spiritual you know, understanding, we can read God's word and begin to understand it without the Holy Spirit to teach us. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 and 3, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand what God is saying. The unsaved person doesn't understand the word of God. you got to first come to a relationship with God through realizing Christ died for our sins and we become children of God. Then the Holy Spirit, through that process called sanctification, helps understand. One day you won't need it. <laughs> I know, so that's sad. But as you as you grow, you'll grow on your own between you and the Holy Spirit. As we're talking, as you sit and listen to the pastor speak, the Holy Spirit will bring verses to your mind. Like uh, when Ken was talking, he said, read someplace and this, the Lord reveals to you. You'd be amazed what the Lord will do for you if you just allow him. Just open up the scriptures and pick a, a paragraph or verse or sentence or whatever it is read until you feel like hey, there's something about this that I, I want to study further. You don't have to study a whole book. You don't have to read the whole Bible. You just need to pick something that God would have. I suggest you start in Psalms or Proverbs or both or some passage or go home and read through some of the stuff that we covered each day. You know, during the week is, yeah, I was wondering about this verse, wondering about that and so on. And I try to break down as much as I can for you, but the Holy Spirit much better teacher. So he will have the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He'll have the spirit of counsel and might. The counsel of might is like counsel and strength. And he'll have the ability to strategize, make a plan, and then execute the plan. And then uh, thirdly, he'll have the spirit of knowledge and of the Lord. And that is fear, not that he's afraid of his dad, but it's a holy, awesome uh, reality that he was totally faithful to the Father. He does everything that the Father asked him to do. Remember reading through his life in the Gospels, everything the Father told him that he did, he accomplished everything. When he's died in the cross, he said, finished, Father, I've done everything you asked me to do. And then uh, God the Father said, I am going to bless you and raise you back up to glory because you accomplished what I sent you to do. 
So clearly the person, uh, the branch is a person. And then Isaiah referred, uh, this is a, a note here, Isaiah referred to the Holy Spirit or to the Spirit with the capital S more times than any other prophet in, in the Old Testament. Now, spiritual qualities are something that are attributed to Jesus, uh, but he is of the line of David or the line of Jesse, but not all of the Davidic kings were spiritual. Out of the 19 kings that came through the Davidic line, only eight of them were good. Well, not 11 of them were evil. And so they didn't, weren't always making good spiritual decisions. A lot of the decisions they made was based more on their wants and desires than it was based on being holy souls out to God. And that's H-W-H-O-L. Uh, so what Jesus is being portrayed as is as God, the, the Son, but also that he is fully in, involved or or and dwelt by the Holy Spirit for power, for wisdom, for understanding, and sometimes those are two different things. But he has all he needs to be able to judge. Terrible. And then verse 3, he talks about his decisions. First, he, his delight is in the Lord. He's not afraid of the Father, but he's in reverence and awe of him because he always said that his Father is greater than he. I don't know how that works out, but he says, in the gospel accounts, the Father is greater than me, but then he says, I and the Father are one. So they understand subjection and reverence for one another, and God the Father evidently has a different role than Jesus the Son or the Holy Spirit has. And so Jesus says that he will be delight, delighting in the fear of the Lord. What that is is that he is so... Uh, conditioned to have the Holy Spirit work within him, that his delight is pleasing the Lord. And you know, we always wonder, well, how do we delight the Lord as being well pleased in his sight? This is the magic word. The Bible tells us, New Testament especially, First John, that saying, if you, if you love God and you don't love your brother, how is how's that possible? How can you love a guy you've never seen when you can't love your brother? You see almost every day. There's a lot of people I know that have family squabbles and they can't get along with one another and that goes on for years and years and years. And uh, so it's just, it's, that's a, it's not the way it's supposed to be. In fact, later on, we'll talk about how the new heaven new earth will take away all that animosity. So he says in um, part of verse three, he says, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide, decide by the hearing of his ear. What do you think those two statements mean? Anybody, everybody, all of us. So, David, we'll look at the outward appearance at the end of your appearance. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Ken brought up today. God looks at the wow. heart. Uh, Solomon told his son that his father, David, told him, My son, give me your heart. And that's what God wants from us is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. He wants our heart. So, what he's talking about there is he said he's not judged by the sight of his eyes. He is no respecter of person. That's God, no respecter of person. No matter how tall or short or good looking or whatever, all equal in God's sight. And so he judges that way. So, what he's saying there is he doesn't make any decisions based on appearances. And appearances there, there's a lot of emphasis on the appearance of the king, the appearance of the priest, the appearance of this, that, or the other thing. And there's a lot of prestige that passed on down to. The time of Jesus Christ, and if you remember, the priest walked about with priestly garments on, and they would write things on their forehead and all this stuff. They spread ashes on themselves, and everybody knew they were in mourning or they were in uh, prayers or or fasting for something from the Lord. And, oh, look how religious they are! And they stood in the prominent places, and they made a big deal of their appearance, and nobody could just stand up against them. Because they were the priests, they were the rabbis, they were the ones who that the thing. So they depended an awful lot of appearance. We do the same thing. What did they say about Trump? They said he doesn't look presidential. What does the president look like? We've got one that sure don't look presidential. <laughs> I mean, so how, how do you judge by looks? And you see some of these people that are actors, actresses, or whoever they are, and, they're, and even people that are artists. They sing songs and so on. They look at them and they're uh, most of the women are scantily clad because it's all about appearance. And the men are, you know, supposed to be good looking men and so on. And it's all about appearance. You can't make it in Hollywood unless you have the appearance 
of either, either diversity now or wokeness or something. You're to go ahead and be tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, that type of thing is not being here and there. We might be tall. But many years ago, we lost the dark hair, and none of us are handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it's not by appearance. And when you look at the judges that were in this recent trial of our ex-president, um, by all appearance, they were judges that should be worshipped. And look how corrupt they were. So just by appearance doesn't mean that you're a wonderful person. Don't just by appearance doesn't mean that you're going to judge rightly. Look at uh, the Supreme Court. They always wear those robes. Every picture, they got the robes on. Almost like we're supposed to bow down and worship them. Lifetime appointments. And, uh, you know, hard to believe they never make a mistake or ever judge by their own likes and dislikes. <laughs> and so you have the, the ability for him to be able to judge not by the side of the body. What would it be for not the side of hearing those ears? Just to be able to hear those people say. Exactly. Gossip. Or what do I tell you about Stu? Oh, I jerk Stu. And, you know, and I'm not out of it. And so it's all about gossip. It's all about listening what other people interpret. Uh, you be. It's not based on hearsay. I can't believe you made that person a deacon. You don't know the story. This person uh, that you just made deacon, he's got a history of all kinds of stuff. He beats his wife, you know, beats his kids, and you know, on and on it goes. And so, oh, I heard something. I, I just want to make a prayer. Let's pray for Brother Stu because he's really going through a lot of time. You know, he's gambling, drinking. That's really tough for him. Don't tell anybody. Let's just pray for Stu because he has a problem. It's hearsay. So not judging by appearance, which we all do. I've got a little measuring rod in my head just like you do, and I judge by appearance. The pious people sometimes are your worst enemies. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we can't we can't judge a book by a skeleton. We really can't because we don't know the person. We don't know what's in their heart. God does. He'll raise up some that will say, Why in the world will God raise that person up? And he always has his purpose. So he will he will judge with righteousness. Verse 4. He will judge by righteousness. He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. There's that word equity. It's D-E-I, you know, diverseness, equity, and whatever that other one, inclusiveness. The equity there is based on everybody being equal in God's eyes. They want, they, you know, who they are, they want everybody equal in their eyes. Not in God's eyes. When God looks at us as believers, he looks at us as his children. At times he disciplines me, at times he disciplines you, at times he uh, does answers a prayer in a positive way for you. Sometimes he uh, says no, not now, or no, no, you don't want that, you don't need that. Like Paul, I prayed three times for him to remove that burden that I had, that thorn in the flesh, so to speak. And God said no, because when you're weak, then I'm strong. If we were, you know, totally able to read scripture and preach well and teach well and raise our kids right, treat our wives right, uh, which we can't do any of those things, but it doesn't make us any more righteous than the next person. We don't know what's in the next person's heart. We don't know the people sitting in the pews next to us, in front or back of us, what their relationship is there. So what he's saying is that he will judge the poor and decide what equity for the meek of the earth. Uh, remember in the Beatitudes, who's going to inherit the earth one day? To me. To me. Now, what does it mean to be me? Humble. Humble. How many of you have ever been humble? You know, as soon as you thought you were humble, you weren't. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> you know, we pray, so let's, let's pray that the Lord keeps him humble. Well, what do you mean keep him humble? How do we know he's humble in the first place? <laughs> humble is something you don't know you are. All right, so then he says, he'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Uh, I've often thought of this verse when he says that Jesus will rule during the millennium with the rod of iron. And so is the rod possibly his mouth, the words that he speaks? You know, Genesis 1, the Lord, Jesus spoke, and all things came into existence. He spoke the words and the stars just went out there and so on. So his word is powerful. By his word, he saves us eternally. By his word, he guides us. By his written word, he reveals himself to us. So if his word is that powerful, do you need a rod or like a scepter or something? 
See, all the kings demanded a rod, remember? Even Esther said, if I go in to see the king, you know, Xerxes, our Xerxes, if I go in there, or Xerxes, if I go in there and he doesn't lower that lance, then he uh, they could have been killing him. So they had stuff like what they would for their own protection. Lance or something like that. They like sometimes I hear rumors that you have armed men patrolling the hallways here. They're in church service in case somebody comes in there. Is that a question? Answer you just wait and yeah. You need to be braver? I must have known that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I try to be conscious of somebody to raise your hand. I like yeah. that, but you're being filmed. <laughs> I, just, I, I don't want to overlook it. You, if you wanted to interject something, I, I don't want to just talk, 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 talk. Uh, but if you wanted to just interject I something. Did, I did have a thought, though. I, I knew that. His rod is the power of his authority. So a physical rod? or Well, it's an image you know. Of the power and authority, it's the solid in the rod of this. And will we see the rod? Pardon? No. Will we see the rod? I don't no. know. I'm just guessing. I, I don't. There may be, but I, I don't believe so. It always talks about the rod of iron. <clears throat> mouth is not iron type of thing. But this is the only verse I can find that talks like that. That, uh, and well, it's not the only one. But he, with his breath, the sword goes out of his mouth when he comes back. The sword goes out of his mouth, and we don't have to do any fighting. I'll have a hard enough time riding that horse from wherever it is down. <laughs> Horses and height don't go together with so that ride down better be quick. But then again, I'll be first going here in anything, right? All right, so righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and the faithfulness the belt of his weight. What other section of scripture does that remind you of in the New Testament? All. Pardon me? Armor All. of God. The armor of God. And that's found in you're right. Ephesians. <laughs> yeah. I heard you say Ephesians chapter six, Jesse. Of course. That was of course it came from the mouth of Stephen, but I saw it from your mouth. <laughs> you're welcome, Jesse. <laughs> Bless you, my son. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so it reminds us of what God asked. Commands us to do is put on the whole armor of God. So we have the bill of righteousness, which holds everything else up, you know, and the shield of faith, which quenches the fiery darts of Satan, and so on. So that's a great passage. Uh, Chris Fisher and I taught uh, fifth and sixth grade boys in Iwana that passage to where they're supposed to memorize. Mm -hmm. Of course, they could look at the Bible's open book, that's the thing. And uh, he thought it was important to teach children about that. That as you grow up, you have enough armor to stand, because that's what the last verse says. When you're covered with the armor, then stand. You don't have to run from Satan, but you know he's not going to necessarily run from you because you, you have no power to thwart Satan. Uh, and Peter says that we can withstand Satan, and he will leave us. But that's only through us being messed up with all our sins, the right standing with God, and so on. If God will protect us. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I've got everything I want to say. His justice for the poor and needy will be right and fair. Uh, we talked about being fair again. The, the, the incidents of trying to be fair with people that work for you is impossible. You can't be fair. Uh, just so you gave them a raise, that's not fair. You give me one. It's not fair. That person had that day off or a week off. It's not fair. You give them better hours. It's not fair. It's not fair. And I would tell him, I said, well, you want me to do this? Yeah, be fair. And I said, I just gave somebody a write up for falling the improvement plan. Should I give you one? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, if I was fair, everybody would be treated the same way. <laughs> so being fair is not what God had in mind. Talking about Jesus being fair with everybody. What's fair for them that might not be fair for us. But being fair, that's like you have the county fair and the state fair. You went in with felt the same way. Uh, so the, uh, the result uh, in verse 4 with justice and for the poor and needy, job being right fair. The result of that is the death of the wicked. So the breath just breathes out and causes death of the wicked. That's what the sword is about. Right. Number 5, um, he has righteousness and faithfulness to God, and he's pleasing to God his father. Remember when uh, the gospel account he says sometimes that God is well pleased with his son. As a matter of fact, when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, then God tell Peter by telling him to shut up. 
And they say, listen to my son. He said, I miss my son in my law, please. At the baptism, is my son in law, please. At the cross, is my son in law, please. Isn't it great that God says that about us? How often does he say that about us? Every time we pay his commandments. Every time we confess our sins. Every time we give glory to him. Every time we do something right for him. Bless him. And they say in Malachi that, they, you know, he's bringing in your ties, test them and that one. You'll open up the windows of that and pour out a blessing. Not necessarily money, but pour out a blessing. You won't have enough room to hold. And, then, and I think it's an Isaiah. I think we'll come to this. Open your mouth wide that I might fill it. Uh, we open our mouth wide, we fill it with food. Uh, but the idea is that God says, ask. Ask. And it'll be given to you. Knock, and it shall be open. Knock. How often do we really pursue the ask, you know, ASK? Asking God for something that we, we desire. How often have we fasted and prayed for something? Because fasting is still for the New Testament. Fasting is for the for the soul. It's 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 when you say, okay, I'm I'm, I'm fasting because I I'm beseeching God to grant me this prayer request because I want to serve Him more. I want to do this to serve Him, and I need some help. Decision maker, where should I go with my life? Now, Luke is down there; he's only seventeen, so his prayer would be, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Some of us are saying, okay, with the time I've got left, Lord, what would you have me to do? And so fasting many times is for the soul because while you're fasting, you get hungry. And every time you get hungry, you should be reminded, why are you hungry? Because I'm fasting for the Lord, which drives your prayer. So fasting is for the soul because it affects us. Praying is for the spirit. Then it say that the Holy Spirit gives us words to say to God beyond our own understanding. Then it say that the Holy Spirit will help us to pray. So even though we're triune, our body doesn't do anything except move around like move around like this here. Uh, tell us we're hungry. But fasting is for the soul because the soul is us inside of us. And our spirit has been reborn by the faith in the Christ's death on the cross. Our human spirit has been rejoined with God. Now we have communion with the Holy Spirit through our spirit. So the Holy Spirit works through our spirit to help us conquer our own nature. Keep us on the right track. You follow me on this here? Yeah. A lot of people look at it. <laughs> Everybody's still awake. All right, so that's um, all right. So that's where we're at. Verses six through nine. It says, "The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and young lion and the fatling together." It's talking there, of course, is the wolf and the lamb are not uh, good friends. You ever watch any of those cartoons about Ralph the dog punching in and the coyote out trying to steal the sheep and Ralph is there to guard the sheep? Well, in a comic relationship, the sheep dog with God is a shepherd, he guards the sheep, and the coyote is Satan. And so the wolf will no longer be chasing the lamb. And the lamb is the young sheep. So the wolf won't be trying to get the young little baby for a sheep. The leper lie down with the young goat. That's a kid. They can go to kids, so he won't feel any bothered with the young one. The young one's will be able to graze right next to him. The calf and a young lion. So that's the calf and the cub. You know, the young lion is a cub. Well, the children can play together. The children of these beasts will be playing together, and laying down together, and napping together. What a joy it is with my two dogs. Uh, Max is like ten times the size of the little guy. And they'll lay down next to each other and just nap. They always are aware of where each one is. I'll have the little one on my lap, and the old fear, the older dog, walking around, like, what's up, where's he going? Jump down and follow him. And then he'll check, and he's okay, you're there. So I'll go lay over here or keep an eye. And when they sleep, sometimes they sleep together. Then we have to kick them off our bed because they think it's their food. So this is talking about a little child leading them. So the child, of course, is from walking age up. Now, I don't think it'll be with a rope or anything because everybody would be friendly. And it said, their young ones shall lay down together and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. So those teeth that you see uh, from lions, you know, ground down or something so they won't have the fangs to eat, eat um, you know, fruit and veggies and you know, things on the ground. 
things like that. A nursing child, that's a little bitty baby, will be able to play by a crow as well, which is a snake, deadly snake. And the wean child, a little bit older, no longer taking mother milk, no longer nursing, he'll be able to put his hand in the viper's den, den of poisonous snake. And nobody will get hurt. Nobody will get hurt. Matter of fact, it says in verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy it in all my holy mountain. That holy mountain, what do you think that holy mountain? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, surrounding area, but Mount, all, all of the world, actually. Mount Zion. Holy, no, no, it's the whole it's the whole world. My, my holy mountain, uh, in particular, Mount Zion, but in the whole world. Because he's talking about worldwide. The curses we lift them off the earth. So this is his kingdom, the whole world. It's not just local. It's like when you when you picture the rapture, picture people flying out and so on. That's all over the earth. There are those flat earth people, but the earth is a, is a globe, a sphere, it's spherical. I looked it up in this morning in the dictionary. Uh, it means circular, globe, sphere, spherical. And that's what uh, the Bible calls the earth. It's, it's spherical, it's round. All the other planets are round. Good night, a flat thing going through space. There's still a lot of wind resistance around, you know, that nice thing. Remember years ago when cars, well, you remember years ago when cars were boxy? Yeah. <laughs> windshield was like that, <laughs> big front end. And then, and then they said, well, we need to cut down the wind resistance. You ever watch those little movies where they, they take a model of a car, they put it in a wind machine, and they should have colors or something like that, colored smoke, and they try to get it to curve like this here. But less wind resistance means you can go faster and so on. Round is a good shape. Take it from me. Round is a good shape. <laughs> so he said, not hurt in all my holy mountain. This is in reference actually to the whole world. Because the whole world is going to be in this place. The next verse, or the next part of the verse says, for the earth can be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so it's talking about the whole world. And it's going to be covered with the knowledge of God. And I know uh, there's people that we used to the Bible college with us says, you know, we're probably going to be teaching the word of God during the millennium because the people won't know the word of God. So we're going to teach them the word of God. And I said to couple, I said, well, you want to teach Jeremiah? Oh, yeah. Well, Jeremiah will be there. <laughs> he could probably teach a little bit better than you can. Matthew will be there. Paul will be there. So if there's any teaching to be done, you would think it's them. And every writer of the book will well, the Bible will be there. Of course, God will be there. Look, he says, oh, the whole world will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Except the start of the millennium. So this whole time frame is during the millennium, right? So everybody that walks in the millennium will be believers and they'll be saved. And God said, I'll pour out on their hearts knowledge of me. Remember Jeremiah chapter 31, 33, and following, verse 33 and following. The new covenant I make with you, I'll write my words on your heart, and everybody will know me. So we're not going to be teaching. I don't know what we'll be doing, but we're not going to be teaching because the word of God says that the whole earth will be full of his knowledge. Now, what will happen during generations that are born during the millennium, they'll be born as sinners because the people that walk in the millennium will be believers, but they'll still be sinners. And so the sin of Adam will still pass through all the way until the new heaven and the earth. So all those people born during the millennium that repopulate the earth, that repopulate the earth, the Bible is okay, so that's to repopulate the earth. Uh, each generation will have to trust Christ as their Savior to become a believer to be able to walk into the new heaven and the earth. Those that don't, they rebel against God at the end of the millennium. When Satan is released again, it says in Revelation that he'll gather as many as the sands of the sea. Hard to believe that. But even with Jesus on the throne, judging harshly many times with his rod of iron, whether it's mouth or symbolic of his power, uh, he's going to be judging harshly. If you don't send people to Jerusalem three times a year to worship me, I'm going to withhold the rain. And it's not like a week to withhold it. It's long enough that they, they would die of starvation because their crops weren't there. And he'll also send 
other diseases and plagues uh, and create death. There will be death during the millennium for those unbelievers. Okay? So what he's talking about there is that it's going to be just a lot like Eden. Okay? With, with the exception of there will be, still be death during the millennium. Uh, God says, why be overly wicked and die before your time? But during the millennium, it talks about also in Isaiah, that a child will be considered uh, still under the age of accountability until he reaches the age of 100. 100. So a long life, again, six, 700 years, people will live, 800 years. If somebody walks in, they're like 144,000. They are saved at the start of tribulation as young men. So young men, 16, 20, 25, whatever the age they are. So they'll live through the millennium. They'll probably marry and have children. And at the end of the millennium, they could be 1,014 years old. I don't know. Sure. I don't know if there'll be any death to the saints at all. He says it's ideal conditions with the possible exception that there'll be still sin in the earth because of the nature of man. Verse 10 says, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. It's the same thing the Bible might say David, but it's still referencing Jesse because he was the start of the root. The, the root of Jesse was formed out of one of the stumps. Going back to turn back to verse 1 of chapter 11. It come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, branch shall grow out of the root. This was part of the remember we looked at this, or maybe you don't. And it talks about, um, let's take more time real quickly. Talk about Assyria and how they had gone over the land of Israel with that plow that had the knife, knives or stakes put into it. Remember the sharp things that they would use for uh, going over the land, preparing the land for uh, plant, planting and that. Remember they had like a, a plow? Yeah, you know, like a drag. It's a drag. Called home, which is from the time of Jimmy Kahn Dragon to that player. They've got now they're more modern looking, but they have curved hooks, steel, and they would drag it across the line, dislodge rocks or whatever it was, but they were using that also to punish the Israelites. They would use that as a torture thing. They would always go down and drag that machine over them. And so that's what he's talking about is that that's one of their punishments. Verse 10, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. Now, what do you think the word banner there? Sit. You can gather around it. <laughs> yes, but what is the banner? You're, you're correct, they gather around it, but what is the banner? Population. Pardon me? Right. In, in a sense, it's him. Would it be a reference to either gospel? He put it from the end of the Messiah. I said, would he put a banner up for anyways? What do That's all banner? funny something. The banner is, the banner is Jesus. Okay, the ba banner could be Jesus, but it's also a flag. Right. We put up a flag, we don't gather any more people around it unless they come to burn it. But <laughs> a banner, have you, ever, have you ever been to a football game or something like that? All the fans usually sit on one side. And they wear apparel that identifies them with that side. And then, well, it used to be, I don't know what it's not, I'm not still playing a football game because I'm boy got <laughs> But they had played the Star Spangled Banner and they come out with flags. And one of the flags that they had here was the flag of the United States. But because of all this wokeness and changing the national anthem to having two anthems now, and kneeling during it and all that other disrespect for the flag, it's no longer a banner. And that's what we're losing in the world is the banner of the United States. It's losing its power in the world. Because everything, when you pick up a dollar bill or a coin, it says, in God we trust. And so our banner should be God, but a visible banner, because you can't see God, would be the flag that represents us. In our neighborhood, there's a, I saw a flag that has the Israel flag and the United States flag together. Uh, so we got a neighbor to fly the flag upside down. In fact, look at that. Isn't that against the law to fly the flag upside down? Mm -hmm. Most people don't know what an upside down flag means. What does an upside down flag mean? You just live in a circle. In distress. The nation is in distress. Why is the nation in distress? No God. No, no God. No hope without God. Mm -hmm. Must be God's current 
administration, this woke mob, all the stuff that's going on, why would God bless the United States? We've abandoned it. We've abandoned the banner. So Jesus is the visible banner, but I believe there's also going to be a visible banner, a flag. I don't know what it's going to look like. It won't be just the Jewish flag. It'll be a world flag. And where is Jesus? Now, Jesus living. Oh, he's over there by that flag. That flag will be over the, uh, the synagogue or the temple in Jerusalem. And then we'll start to rally around. You've heard that rally around the flag or type of thing. No longer did they do that. I remember when I was in service back in the wooden days, wooden guns. <laughs> but we were very proud to march for the United States. It was, it was an honor to serve. Not no more. I, I felt so bad for the Vietnam vets when they come back and they were being so disrespected, people spitting on them and throwing things at them. Because they're at the president's request to go over there. Of course, we lost that war, but and people were horrible, horrible for the people that come back from Vietnam. There you are, off and off your lights on or on crutches and everything else, and people are treating them with so much disrespect. It was horrible. And so we no longer respect the United States. You know, the, I'll, I won't get into what's in our army now. Okay. So in that day, verse 10, it's talking again about the millennium who shall stand as a banner for a people that is Jesus, uh, but he will also have the uh, banner of the kingdom of God there. The last verse there says that Gentiles will seek him. And this is the God of Israel. But the Gentiles will seek him as the one true God. And his resting place shall be glorious. Where is his resting place? In the uh, New Jerusalem. That's correct. You know, of all the planets, all the galaxies, all the stars and suns and everything around there, why would God choose to live forever on Earth? Why would He do that? It's the center why of the universe. The sun? Pardon? It's the center of the universe. Well, I believe that. I, I do. I believe that. I believe in the Old Testament. That's why they say the sun rose in the east and set in the west. Now, uh, sure, the earth spins. It's not spinning enough to throw people off. Last I knew, unless you're drunk, you didn't fall off. <laughs> but the earth spins to keep gravitational pull going. That's in the inter interspace, station or the stars or IIS or something. They spin, not you know, a million miles an hour, but they spin to keep gravity. I mean, all the moons I've seen, when people start floating, oh, we lost our spinning bank. <laughs> so everybody looked for the spinning <laughs> But the Old Testament people saw that and said that God said, the earth is my footstool. And God created all of the universe. He could have set up his kingdom on Pluto. And that transported us all the Pluto. But he said, my forever dwelling place will be on earth. It's going to be a remade earth, but the new heavenly Jerusalem is going to come down on this earth. And when you read the Old Testament about God's dwelling place, God's perfect place, God's glorious place, you're talking about Jerusalem. You're talking about a place on this earth who is, Jerusalem is equidistant from every other city in the world. And I was, I was telling, I think it was Lucas, and I might mention to you guys that the Supper of the Lord, when the carnivorous birds will come, uh, twice a year, uh, millions of birds fly from the north to the south and from the south to the north and so on each year. And they go to one land mass in the world that provides enough place for them to eat, rest, and then fly again. And millions of birds come through this area every year. <clears throat> at land mass that they pass over the year. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. God has determined that the earth is where he wants to spend eternity with us. So we're earthbound, but God is going to live in himself in the person of Jesus to be in our earth. And we'll always be forever with him. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it because it'll be a new world. There's going to be trash out there, people or litter. <laughs> Verse 11, it should come fast in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. When is the second time? Is it when he released the children from bondage in Egypt and rescued all the children of Israel out of Egypt when he parted the Red Sea? Is it when he brought them back after the 70 year captivity? And the Babylon uh, dynasty ruled them for 70 years and then Medes and Persians come along and released them and they had Jerubbabel and Daniel, not Daniel, Jerubbabel and and uh, Nehemiah coming back down here to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, 
we don't belong. Is that the regathering that we saw about the second time? Yes. When is the second time? The next line says to recover the remnant of his people who are left. That yeah. sounds like late and tribulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The people are, are gathering there now because, as stats say, as much as you can trust statistics, is there were more Jews living in America than there were in Israel. Mm -hmm. And then they had the uh, all the things that happened with Israel, the Seven Day War, or Six Day War, whatever it was, 1967, and some of the things that happened over there, and Jews started going back to the land. But most of them are back in unbelief. And some of the missionaries say it's, it's the toughest place to wish to uh, minister to and try to get people to trust Jesus as a Messiah. Because they're in so much disbelief there. Because look what God did to them. And, and how could our Messiah die? I mean, that's a question I can't answer. How can our Messiah die? Uh, God provided Isaiah to tell us a lot about the Messiah. We've already seen it in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 9. Now in chapter 11, we're going to catch it again and again and again. And Isaiah chapter 3 sums it all up. He wounded for our transgressions. He's hung on the cross. And, you know, so it points us to him. But the Jewish mind is blinded by Satan. They can't accept that. But what it's saying there is that to recover his people, and a lot of people are saying, well, the regathering today is what it's talking about. Or the regathering after they were freed from Egypt. They went in there, there was only 70 people left in Egypt. Remember when Joseph died? His family came down to Egypt. He and his father, uh, Jacob, came down. Jacob died. Then his older brother, because he was the second youngest. We don't know for sure when they died, uh, but they all died in Egypt, and so what it says in the last verse of chapter 50 in Genesis, and uh, Joseph's body was in the coffin in Egypt. So from that beginning, in the beginning, in the Genesis, everybody was made perfect in Adam and Eve without sin. They were innocent without sin, but then sin entered in and people died. So many, this person lived so long, many years, many died, this person lived so many years, many died. And, uh, so God is always saving a remnant. Because Jewish people are not worldwide uh, populous because they've been, they've been set apart so many times for disbelief or unbelief or rebellion against God, but he always says a remnant. So it started out in Egypt with 70 people. And then there were worlds of Pharaoh didn't know Joseph and they put him in slavery. During that 430 years, they grew over to three and a half million people. Yes, sir. Where the uh, Jewish customer, you know, right? They had several villages and conflicts, right? Going on with their lawn and everything. And he passed away. They took him back to Israel, buried him. Yep. That is a Jew. Yep. When they do that, here they are. They're all your house. When there's a lot of Jews, it's like, don't even think of this. Well, the only thing I do is bury him before the next day. Right. So it's, it's, it's part of the arrogance. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a commandment to bear for the next day or whether that was a tradition. I think it's a tradition. If you look through the law, I can't remember, of course, it's been a long time since I read through Leviticus. Not a book that you read when you're tired. <laughs> but I can't remember now. During the Ten Commandments type of thing, there's nothing there about bearing person before the next day. But the Jews, by tradition, have done that for years. And I think it's because when Jesus died on the cross, he was married to those today. Yeah, unless he goes to those unbelieving and people and all that. But they still follow the tradition. Well, maybe. Uh, they took him down before 6 p.m., which starts a new day. But he was also a religious, so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, that's one of the questions that we'll ask. And I will welcome to ask them. I'll recognize you when you have a beer or not. <laughs> <laughs> My brother in law did, but I can get a hop. I need to turn that out. All right. So now he's talking, and I want to hit a little bit more into verse 11. Here. Come to pass in that day, the Lord shall set his hand against again the second time. This is at the millennial, at the end of tribulation, the millennium. Recover the 
remnant of these people are left. Now he lists where those people are from. And I wrote more of their modern names. If you look there, uh, I don't know who Pathos and Twitch is and uh, Elam and Shiner. So I, I copied this out of another source. Talking about Israel, Egypt, northern Egypt, and southern Egypt. Uh, Ethiopia, which is South Africa. Elam, Babylonia, Hamath, and all distant coastlines. So the, re the regathering is from all across the earth. Okay? So bear that in mind because when it says in verse 12, he'll set up a banner for the nation. So that's where I get the physical banner of a flag. Flags were very uh, much in prevalence in the Jewish worship. I attended a church a while back um, and uh, they had uh, not six flags. Six flags over Jordan here up here in Colorado. <laughs> Flags over uh, but anyways, uh, this was a, a church of uh, Peter Lord, which the guy's name, what a terrific name, Peter Lord. And he was a great defender of the faith. He, was, he, was, he used to have churches of thousands of people, then he moved to another church and just, he was just that charismatic. And uh, he would say, well, I went over there one time for a weekend or three or four days. Just to see how he runs the church in there, and uh, he he said he said he'd rather have a church of just two hundred people that he could minister to two hundred people than a church of a thousand because you can't reach. Um, so he's just very very good at explaining about one of those pastors that just makes you feel relaxed and you're learning something from him. Chuck Swindoll is another one that I really admire because he's able to take something and make it real. You're there in the scene. I I try to emulate those. I'm not very successful at it, but I do try to make it alive for me because I see it a lot. Anyway, so during one of the services at the church, these people started coming in all the aisles of the church and they were waving flags and um, they were just kind of dancing stuff like that. And one of them I said, wow, how disrespectful of that. And then he went into the sermon and quoted several verses where they did the very same thing David was in. And they brought the ark back in and he was dancing, probably kingly robes and dancing with people. They, Celebration bringing the earth back into Jerusalem and so on. And they talk about all these things, and they have a lot of banners. When the different tribes got together, they each had a family banner. You know, all 12 sons had their own banner for their, their tribe. And when they set up their tents around the tabernacle in the wilderness, somebody stuck that flag in the front there. And of course, the front was always facing the temple. And so that was where Reuben sat. That's where Simeon was. That's where, you know, all the all the children of Jacob were. So they had that. Of course, they had the art back then. That was just the of God. But if you think about that, and you say, why don't we have that? And a couple of um, Christmases ago, Steve came out playing the drum. Or off the pump. And then another Christmas, had that little boy. Can't remember not who, who it is, but he played the drum. During the whole time, they were up in the stage. And everyone's always told me a lot of the boys off the pump. And I thought, you know, that is really making it alive for me. I love that. Uh, we should celebrate God more. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that we don't have something to celebrate. We can celebrate God. Some people celebrate God and just very friendly, very happy all the time. Some people celebrate God. I do it very far, you know, that type of thing. But we should celebrate God. He's uh, He's the God of the universe. He's the God that saves us. He's the God that protects us. He's the God that guides us. He's the Almighty God. He's sovereign. And sometimes we walk around like we serve a, you know, some clerk at another store. You know? What do they call them? The Burger Line Chef or something like that. Guy that they charge you on the show. You know, so we should celebrate the God we serve. He's mighty. He's great. He's awesome. Like I said back to Paul, I said, God is great all the time, and all the time God is great. You know, that kind of stuff. Because he is. You know, though we're going through trial and tribulation, he's still good to us. He gives us just enough. He doesn't overpower. Second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talked about, he says, we're, we're, we're down, but we're not up. You know, it's song, I get back up again. It's not how many times you're knocked down, how many times you get back up. Success is measured in goals attained. Faithfulness is measured in goals of tension. It's not wrong to fail. It's wrong not to try. And so when I see this about them 
praising God for everything. As a matter of fact, chapter 12 is all praise about God. In verse 12, verse 12 uh, he says, He will set, Jesus will set up a banner for all the nation and will assembly, will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the depressed of Judah. And then the interesting statement says from the four, four corners of the earth. Some of your translation might say from the ends of the earth, which is a much better translation of corner. I told you a few times um, that sometimes looking up a word in a dictionary will pretty open things up. I looked up a sphere in the dictionary. Guess what the word sphere means? Rock or gold. But I looked up this word, uh, corners, in my strong concordance, the Hebrew word, and it means this. It means an edge or extremity, like the bird's wing, the extremity of his wing. It means a wing, uh, like the garment or bed clothing. People have ever made a bed and said, you got to get the corners right with the bed. Well, Jerry, yeah. <laughs> well, those are the uh, A flap, like a flap of the earth, or a quarter of a you know, a, a building or something like that. A bird, a border, a corner, and overspreading or the uttermost part. So the best translation is he will gather from the, um, what does it say? Who's got a different than four points? Who's got something that says from the end of the year? And we got that translation that says from the end of the year? Well, it means holy. And a whole earth? Or most remote part. Yeah. So it's a lot better for the corner. So flat earth people, that's not my nieces, two nieces, they say, see there? Yeah. You got to have four corners on a square or a rectangle. <laughs> the earth is flat. How come we haven't found any corner? Inquisitive people want to know, where's the edge? Well, you can't see because we're under a door. I mean, like a cake pan, you know, cake pan or something. <laughs> you watch that movie, the, the, the dome. It's, and uh, then they come up with, well, the word sphere actually means something different, that it's not it's not round. Yeah, so you look up there and see all these other planets, all of them are round. Right. The moon you can see with your eye. looks round to me. Right. The face there is good, too. But the, the round is less resistance to wind. I mean, God is not stupid. And then there was something about the rocks that they got from the moon. And then they found out, well, these rocks are the same rocks we had on Earth. Hoax, hoax, hoax. We never got to the moment. Is that possible? God made the same rocks in the universe. Could be. And science has said that the planet Mercury never was that close to the sun because the crust is so thin that it's perfect. And this guy talking said 5, 000, 5 million years ago, Mercury is way away from it, and Neptune and, and uh, Jupiter were up close because they had thick romances. Then they moved out. Some five million years ago, the Mercury moved in, was sucked in by the sun's gravitation. <laughs> and then he went on to say, with a straight face, in another five million years, Mercury will be sucked into the sun and burst. I'm watching this TV program, and can give me this education. And then he smiled and said, Christ, this is down with me around five million years. Now, how can you draw it? Well, then I looked up. Uh, The Euro Mountain. Uh, this is now we're having a conversation about Euro Mountain. You know, anybody know where the Euro Mountain? Other than those of where the Euro Mountains are, the U R A L. Probably in Russia somewhere. Eurasia. Yes, it, there, there's a mountain range between Europe and Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, Russia is no longer called Russia in a sense. All of that from the east of the Euro Mountains is all called Asia, and now Asia is the biggest land mass. And you know, I have an old globe that was uh, a relic of a small globe. And China's a lot bigger on the globe. Because years ago, when I was growing up, I was to school. Of course, there's only 48 uh, stars on the flag. So I, I, I had that shirt on that I wore. Uh, I wear it every 4th of July. It's got the flag with the, uh, 50 stars on it. And I said, well, this shirt is so old. I'm talking to Bill Russell. I said, this shirt is so old. And when I bought it, it only had 40 stars on it. I had to sock, so two more stars on it. Because <laughs> in 1959, it was only 48 stars. And during that year, we had a few states. What two states did we had in 1959? Hawaii. Alaska, Hawaii. Very good. Well, he said, 
first place it was the first. Yeah. Hawaii was the fifth. So Alaska was the point of that. I know that because the program on TV was Hawaii 5 0. Right. And people said, no, that don't mean that. Yeah, this is the 50th state of Hawaii. I, um, no, it has some other meaning. Yes. Well, tell me the meaning. I looked up the program and it said it was because they were the 50th state. You know, some people argue about all kinds of stuff. But anyway, so back to the scripture is where we started. The four corners of the earth meanly, uh, mean the uttermost from all the regions. And he listed all the regions in the last part of verse 11. This is where he's going to gather them from, not outer space. And not from a physical corner of the earth, but from these lands. This is where the Israelites were spread out through captivity, uh, through leaving, uh, whatever it was. Even uh, in the book of the Judges is followed by the book of Ruth. And Ruth starts out in verse 1, said, this happened during the time of the Judges, when uh, Naomi and her husband and two sons left Israel because it was a famine during the time of the Judges. And so we've experienced all those things during the earth has gone through all these times. And so the children of Israel have been dispersed through captivity for centuries, ever since they became a nation. They went down to Egypt. They went up, they went down to Egypt twice with Abraham. And they went other places. And where are we supposed to go? I said, I want you right here. I want you right here. And well, yeah, well, over here. I want you right here. That type of thing. So, so we look, yes. so is that going to be any uh, Jews is born outside of Israel, like if Jew is born in the United States, will he be go back to Israel? Yep. You could draw him back. He will, he will be drawn back. Now, I don't know if that's compelled, but the, the Jewish nation as a whole still prays for the peace of Israel. Well, peace for Israel will not come until when, when they see the millennium take place and the Messiah is revealed. Many of them will say, well, that was Jesus. That's the one we rejected. But they'll recognize the Messiah. They'll set up his rule in the end of tribulation when all these nations are disciplined. And then the separation of goats and sheep in Matthew chapter 25, only the same will go in there with these 144,000 have been them all along now for seven years. The Messiah is Jesus. He was here. He's coming back. And so Jews will want to go to Israel, whether saved or unsaved. But at this point in time, they will be believers. They'll be drawn there, and they'll be believers in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, the only reason I know that is because in Jeremiah chapter 31 says that we can write their word on their hearts and so on, and when we're going to save people that enter the land. So if they're drawn back to Israel during the tribulation, that'd be pretty sad. Why would you want to go back home to King Israel? Right. They will recognize it worldwide as the 70th week of Daniel. It says in the scriptures, when you see the agreement made by the Antichrist for seven years, you know that in the middle of that, the Antichrist is not going to be people at three years. Yeah, so that's what they will all be. That's what most of them will go back to. Well, they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll be drawn years. back. They'll be drawn back. Right. And the more brave ones will come back to Israel during the tribulation. Others will wait till the millennium, but they'll be yeah, drawn back. They wait till the millennium, they won't be saved. That's correct. That's, That's correct. They won't go into the millennium. That's correct. So see how you deduce that? Because of the knowledge we have about the millennium. Right. So if the Jews are drawn and they don't come back, then they're not believers. If they come back, they got to be believers before the end of tribulation. So they would have, if they did come back, they'd have to become believers because of the seven weeks of Daniel. So only the saved ones will enter into the group. So that's how you that's how you determine scriptures. You know this fact, so you know this fact, so you know this fact, and so you oh, oh then that's what put it all in your fact. Okay, so they could be drawn back and unbelief. That's where they are now. They've been drawn back. There's a big population. No longer is the United States have more Jews than Jerusalem. For a while back, if you looked at some of the maps on nationality, they showed a map of Florida. And from about Lakeland all the way south, it was a huge Jewish population. Huge Jewish population. Of course, we're a democratic country. So you're saying there's more Jews in Israel than in the United States? Yeah. Today? Well, that's what I've read. I've not counted them. That's the population of Jews who live in Michigan, I'll tell you. <laughs> I live right next door. Well, how, how many are there? I bet there's more, well, but you don't know. 
Oh, you said what blue pill? Right. Well, it's just like people that say, I don't know how big the ark was. I don't know how many animals were on it, but I just know that all those animals couldn't fit on that ark. So we don't know. Small animals. <laughs> yes. They're small animals. Is that a, a hand raised down there? There's, according to Google, uh, 15.7 million people are Jews, which is 0.2% of the population. In the United States? 2% of the world po global population. Okay. Oh. Well, does it say how many are Jews in the United States? No, it, well, uh, let me see. <laughs> okay, while well, you're looking at it, we'll continue. Verse 13 says, The envy of Ephraim shall depart. Ephraim is the name for the northern ten tribes. 7.2 million in the U.S. Okay, so how many are there in Jerusalem? Eight. Eight people? No, eight. Eight, 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 eight million. million. Okay. Because there's 15. So there's more 5. people in Jerusalem, more Jews than Jerusalem. Yep. Very true. Yeah, you're early. Well, there's more. <laughs> there's more. There's more. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> well, you know, they're pretty safe in Miami. I mean. Yeah, well, they are. You know, nobody's crazy. sending rockets into Miami. <laughs> so why don't you go there? <laughs> I, I yeah. know up in New York, but they don't have it so good there. They got no. all sorts of anti Israel protests. Well, it, those are actually, when you bring that up, they're increasing in, in uh, the treatment of the Jews across the nation because it's the group of Palestine, so Palestine. And they're saying that to the Jews, from the, the river to the, the river to the sea has been not just the Jordan, it really means from the Euphrates. To the Mediterranean. They say, well, from the Jordan, but they didn't want to bother the west or the east bank of the Jordan. East bank, they gave over, and they got the ship, they gave over, and it's not enough for them. They want to terminate one of you. I think in Florida, I, I know there was one university that had some protests. I don't know if there's any more than that, but uh, they were shut down immediately. Yep. <clears throat> they, they, were, they were not tolerated. You know, the whole day. I think it, that's thanks to our government. Yeah, that, that's right. It's come down from him. It's called law and order. And these things are not permissible. We didn't have a lot of uh, rioting in the street either. Burning buildings that, I mean, we had some, but not nearly what some of the other states had. The rule of law and order. Thank our government for that. Well, incidentally, we only had two more years to go. All right, so back in here to verse 13. Talks about the envy of Ephraim. Ephraim was always jealous of Judah. Kingly Lion was in Judah. And Ephraim was the child of Joseph. He was the second born child. Manasseh was first born, he was the second born. And so he had the biggest tribe up in the northern part of Manasseh was split, half went, stayed on the east side of the Jordan River when they first went up. Uh, Apple and Asa, Gad, and Asher, who it was, stayed on the east side. And the rest of them went in. But when Joshua went in, he made them send their fighting men with them so they could conquer the land. And after the land was conquered, then they could go back and be with the people. They liked it on the east side. It was perfect for them. But they were the first ones living in captivity. They did for thinking. Anyway, so you have uh, the envy there with Ephraim. He's always against him. Don't forget. Um, Manasseh and he, he from his brothers fought all the time. We saw that when in earlier chapters of Isaiah, when they were going to band together with Assyria or Syria and Aram and go down there and, and split Judah and two and each take a half. There was always jealousy there. And then uh, the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Uh, Jews in the South, the two tribes of Judah were the ones that wanted to walk around Samaria, around that land. And Samaria was the capital of the northern ten tribes. So there was a lot of jealousy, a lot of anger, stuff like that. So they would walk around that place. That was the whole purpose of the Good Samaritan. Who's my neighbor? The Good Samaritan. He was from Samaria. He helped the Jew out who was beaten and robbed. And then he says in verse 16, they, but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. These are the ones that had 
plundered them and robbed them and denied them passage when uh, Joshua is leading them up to the promised land. Moses already died. Joshua is now in charge. And so he's leading the people up to the promised land. In order to do that, they on, had to be on the east side of the Jordan River and went through the land of Edom, which is Esau, the land of uh, Ammon, which is the daughter of Lot and his, and his daughter, and then uh, Moab, which is the son of his the Lot's daughter. And, uh, it's a mouthful. Anyways, they were all on the and he says, um, they'll fly down. What it is is now they're combined, and this, of course, is during tribulation period and so on. They shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. They were all on the oh, where Gaza is. And together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Eden and Moab and the people of Ammon. They shall obey them. Finally, you get some retribution. So this is part, the end, the end part of the tribulation will be the line. Verse 15, the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. So what is the tongue of the sea of Egypt? That's the mouthpiece. That's the king of Egypt making all these claims. He's the king. He's the one who wants to make peace treaties with Israel. And he's not uh, keeping them. He's breaking them all the time. So he, Israel has always tried to find some neighboring nation that will be on their side to help them fight against the enemy instead of depending on God. God says, don't depend on other nations. I'll be your God. I'll protect you. I'll go before you and fight your battle for you. And they didn't want to do that. He said he would destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt, which could also be referenced to the Mediterranean or to the Red Sea, which is part of it. With his mighty wind, he would shake his fist along the river. Now, this is the Euphrates, and make it into seven streams to make men cross over dry shot. In other words, they'd be walking over dry land because the rivers would be so small, they can easily walk over them at any one time. This is also a prophecy when China or that army up to the northeast, who are 200 million strong, will march, they'll march across the Euphrates riverbed. So this is the same frame, time frame, only now it's a little bit clearer because God's going to breathe on it. So with his hand, causes a great wind to split the Euphrates into seven streams instead of river. Uh, low tide enough will be small enough that whole army or even the Egyptian, uh, excuse me, the Israelites can walk across because he's making a He's making a pathway for the Israelites. Uh, verse 16, there'll be a highway for the remnant of his people. So when they're coming there from other nations, he's also drying up the river Euphrates so they can cross over and walk over the land by themselves. But it'll also pave the way for China, wherever that Northeast country is at that time because they send the troops down. So he's got that highway for the remnant of his people who be left from Syria as it was for Israel. In the day they came up from the land of Egypt. So the same thing is going to happen that when the children of Israel left Egypt, he widened the waters there so they passed through dry land. He's going to do the same thing in that sense when he splits the Euphrates River in the seven smaller streams. The stream is always smaller than the river. So they'll be able to walk across it and come back home to Israel. So while he's making this highway for the Israelites to come back to, it's also going to play in the future when China sends their 200 million troops down there to invade Italy at the conclusion of the um, period of tribulation. Yes. You with me on that? Everybody say yes. Mm -hmm. Verse 12 is more of a prayer and praise. Uh, in that day, verse 1, chapter 12, you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Uh, there's quote marks around uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, O oh Lord, I will praise you, though you were angry with me. Your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song has also become my salvation. So he goes into a little bit of a detail here with what the people are going to be like. They're going to be shouting for praise. So a lot of churches don't do that. They don't just get excited about, you know. God working or something like that. So I'm not saying you should do that after, after but a couple of amens would help them. You know, whatever happened to the amen corner? Do we have an amen corner? No, it was very, very, very state. <coughs> Suit ties. <coughs> Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing?
All right, I'm a little bit, I'm a little more flamboyant. Look at the shirt on. Yes. America needs Jesus. So I'm a little more flamboyant. And I, I'm not going to run shit. Anyway, so the big day, of course, or the, that day, of course, the millennium, God is my, self, my salvation, which produces no more fear. So he's saying, so if you have salvation now past, you should not be afraid. And how often we're afraid to stand up for God. How often we're afraid to, you know, cast our vote or speak up for God. How often we let an opportunity go by without witnessing with somebody or a friend or something. How often we don't go to the grocery store with a smile on our face. People say, why are you smiling? Because God saved me. God is my salvation. Is he yours? And so it's that happiness that said, no pepper says, you know, if you're happy, you make your face shine with that thing. Tell your face you're happy. And so you're, uh, you were angry with me. Sometimes we get disciplined. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the New Testament, God disciplines every child. There's no child of his that has not been disciplined. If you say you've never been disciplined, then you're not a child of God. Because <laughs> he disciplines every child he receives. Now, either he disciplines <laughs> every child or you are not a child. So you can expect it. You can expect trials and tribulations and hard times because that's to help us become more Christless. And it's to help us have more faith because faith works patience. And then we say, okay, I'm glad I prayed about this. I'm just waiting on you. You know, and sometimes I believe, I believe prayer with God. God, you know my heart. I prayed for this for a long time now, so I'm just going to wait on you. If you say no, that's fine with me. If you say yes, that's fine with me. Either way, I'll praise you. That's what's hard, being thankful in all things. Thankful for the times we had tough. Thankful for stints. Like Paul uh, said in his letter, letter to us, he said, I thank, I thank God for the doctors that were able to operate to replace my knee with the technology God has given mankind to be able to do things like that. I mean, they didn't cut his leg off with the knee and the soul back up. So probably three old things. Mm -hmm. So a science is advanced, thank God. And so we can thank medicine, good medicine. And we can thank God that he protects us. He, he heals us daily for the cold or whatever. It is. And so a lot of times when we suffer a cold or something like that, so we can identify with somebody else. Well, I was sick, so I didn't want to use it. Oh, man, I know it's well, like that stuff. Oh, yeah, sore throat. Oh, yeah, cough, 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 cough. Well, so then you stay home. Don't bring the cold in here. So that's being comforting. It's also turning your prayers over to God. I will trust and not be afraid, verse 2 says, because the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. That's why you're moving into the... Um, the area called sanctification. He saved us eternally. And now he saves us daily. This is a daily salvation song. He saves me daily. He brings me through trials. He teaches me. Verse 2. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the well of the salvation. And in that day, he will say, the idea of water is always symbolic of God's blessing. When the children of Egypt had wanderings in the desert for 40 years, God provided water. He also provided manna for him to eat, the bread of angels. And what did man do? I'm sick and tired of that. I want meat. So God sent him in seven pheasants, quail, by the high of their shoulders. They're knocking them down with sticks and rocks and everything else. And they're eating. And while their mouths were still full, this food, God sent a plague, a plague among them, and they began to die. And that's when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. He stopped the plague. He says, I'm not satisfied with what you give me, guys. I want more. Mm -hmm. God says, be content with what you have. Paul says, the book is, I've learned to be content with what I have. <clears throat> if you don't learn to be content, I mean, I have a rough ride with God. Because he'll withdraw stuff from us to give our attention. And he'll supply our needs. He'll take care of all our needs. I've got to study Matthew 6 sometimes. <clears throat> so he said, uh, the water there is used symbolic. Uh, supplying everything we need for this life. Hold your place there and turn a couple books over, well, quite a few books over, to Joel. Uh, after Daniel, you have Hosea, Joel. So two books past Daniel, so you get to Genesis. Uh, see if you can find Genesis. Jeremiah, then Ezekiel, then Daniel, the next book is Hosea, and then Joel. Joel's a very short book. Joel chapter 2. Verse 
After Daniel? No. Yep, after Daniel. Then Hosea. Joel. Then Joel. And then Joel. Okay. It's almost there. Two books past Daniel. Chapter 2. Verse 23. Everybody there? Joel chapter 2. Two books past Daniel. You're right. Chapter 2. Yep. Yeah, chapter 2. Verse 23. Everybody there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. And he'll cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Verses following says God's going to restore all that. But the idea is that when we come to Florida, we have to realize that the reason it's green is because it rains a lot and it's very humid. A nephew and his wife are now visiting from Kentucky. Every day they've been going to the beach, worshiping God's rock. But anyways, they said, boy, it's really hot here this year. Yes, it is. Really humid. You walk outside and um, talk to what's that? Yeah, it does that. If you don't like it, you know where the highway is going to go north. Um, but what do you expect? You want to live in a, a warm area. You want to be able to walk around in shorts and short sleeve shirts most of the year. You don't want to see snow. You want to have nice grass and trees and flowers. You're going to have to have a lot of rain, and a lot of sun, and a lot of humidity. And if you don't like the rain and humidity, go to Arizona. Temperature is 108, but don't worry, it's only a dry heat. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you don't like it here, move. Quit complaining. But people want to come here for vacation. Hot rains are, yeah, during the summer, rains every day. Keeps the grass from burning up, trees from wilting, flowers from wilting. Isn't it pretty? Yeah, it's green everywhere. Flowers, oh my goodness. Yeah, it's because it rains for a <laughs> So God sent the former rains when they went out and plowed. They dragged that, what did you call it again? Great plow. The drag, drag thing? Harrow. Harrow. Yeah, they put something on an oxen or something. They made places for lay seed in that. Well, the former rains are heavy rains. And they level the field out. They knock the rills down where it come up with dug, knocks it down and covers the seed with it. And so the former rains are more heavy. You don't want heavy rains when you're harvesting. So God says, I'll send the former rains for you faithfully. April time frame, March, April, May time frame, May flowers, you know, the April rain brings May flowers and so on. Then the harvesting in August, September, uh, other rain that comes and Kind of finish your crops off. That's why they, at the end of those, they had the feast of booth when they said, Thank you for the bountiful crop. And then, you know, the idea of the psalmist praying in the morning, Lord, give me a good day. And then at night comes just, Lord, thank you for giving me a good day. And when you think about the rain, it's the same water that fell during the flood. God created water during the six days. As a matter of fact, it was the first day. Let the water separate, dry land appear. God created water. Man cannot create water. We know it's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. How do you put that stuff together? Make water. Man cannot make water. They try to see clouds and make it rain, but they can't really make it rain. And so only, only God can make that. He created water. So in the process of time, what does the water do? It's dry and goes up, it forms clouds, and then they get heavy, and when they rain, it comes down. And all the nitrogen that left the earth and goes up in the air, that's it's all brought down to nurture the land again. And so if you look at the rain today, it's the same water that fell during the flood. So the flood was worldwide. It rained all over the earth. So it didn't have to rain just in the area where, where Noah, Noah was. It rained all over the earth. So the water is here, unless it went to a cloud and floated something itself. All rain is composed of water that God made and created. So if you want a daily Miracle. When it rains, that's God. He created the whole process of evaporation, condensation, and it's been going on for well, about six weeks now, right? So if you want that as a, a measure, say, well, rain is a sign that God loves you, then what else did he put in the rain? A rainbow. 
when you see a rainbow, guy says, I'm not going to destroy the world by watering it. You might have local flooding, but you'll not have a worldwide flood. Back to Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. And in verse um, four, four. I, I covered verse three with the joy, waters, the joy of your salvation. You know about the washing of the word. We've been some great sermons on read here about the washing machine and that washing in, for regeneration. It's also for cleansing, stuff like that. And verse four says, In that day you will say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. So the people during the millennium are going to make his name exalted. And those people that were not Jewish did not live through the Old Testament time. They were Gentiles living now in this kingdom. So it would be Jews, Gentile alike. But God is not going to make us all one people. We're going to still be Jews and still a nation. It says, verse 5, it says, Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. So his, no, his, his name is his provision, his power, everything will be known throughout the earth, and yet he, people still turn for him and for the end of the land. Verse 6 says, cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. So in verse 4, he said, declare his deeds among the people. See, so the Jews are, are to spread the news about God's uh, doing in their lives. All the deeds that he did for the Israelite nations that Gentiles have not no knowledge of. Okay, so next week we'll pick up on chapter 13, which begins another uh, chapter 13, all the way through, I think, chapter 18, deals with the other nation. So we, we're going to fairly quickly on this couple of chapters a week, uh, maybe when possible. Sometimes we'll skip some of them if there's just a generation. That's, that's only for people that really, really want to cure their, their sleep problems. All right. Any questions before we close? Would you like to close it, uh, brother? Father, we thank you that you have given us this book to reveal to us your working in the lives of the people that you created. And we thank you that we have come to rest our faith and trust in you for salvation and hope for eternal life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.